Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Village of Elsa committee meeting. Today is January 29th, 2018. We'll call this meeting to order at 7.32. Uh, can you call the roll, please? Sure. Trustee McGrail? Here. Trustee Dalzell? Here. Trustee Pierce? Here. Trustee Zielinski? Here. Trustee Juarez? Here. Trustee McLaughlin? Here. Mayor Ryan? Here. We have a quorum. Thanks. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. start with any your agenda officers report starting with my own report uh, just to keep the the trustees and village up to speed you know, we've had a I had a uh, presentation to me this week made by the an organization let me pull this up here known as the uh, Illinois Housing Development Authority I asked them to come back and make a presentation to the board on February 12th uh, this 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 is a um, this organization is affiliated with the state of Illinois and offers affordable housing programs to help. Uh, they've actually got about four different programs. Uh, they have four popular programs being offered by this agent, as I said, on behalf of the state of Illinois. First one is known as the First Home Illinois program, where they offer $7,500. Cash assistance for first-time home buyers that meet eligibility requirements. The second is called the I Refi program, which offers up to fifty thousand dollars in federal assistance to buy down your mortgage and refinance you into an affordable loan. Uh, the third is a program known as the Hardest Hit program. Um, and basically, if your earnings drop by more than fifteen percent. Uh, you could qualify for up to $35,000 in federal assistance. And the last one was, which might be as of interest to us, we've got a couple of these things going on right now, but is a blight reduction versus abandoned property program. This program provides financial resources to assist communities with neighborhood uh, greening and redevelopment, including reimbursement for demolishing or rehabilitating abandoned homes. We've actually got a couple of projects coming up that we could probably get some help with. Uh, we've got one home uh, I'm getting a second quote on right now uh, over on 120th place that it's been um, abandoned for some years now. And through our attorneys, we did get approval to move forward with demolition. But because of cost, uh, it ran right around $20,000. We want to get a second estimate, just be on the safe side for the board to approve when the time comes. Also, I asked uh, Mr. Early to have the um, both companies get us a price on demolition for the old car wash that we purchased. So we were going to combine that with another demo project, but uh, fortunately in this uh, agreement that we have uh, with the redevelopment, that's going to be part of that. We don't have to worry about that aspect of it right now then too. So at least we can show some progress that this needs to be done. And certainly I, I really hope we, we qualify to get reimbursed. This money is on a first-come, first-served basis, and there's a lot to be, not a real lot, but there's a lot enough to be explained where I thought it would be best for them to serve this up to the board on February 12th. So we'll, we'll have this agency come in then and make a presentation. Also had a request uh, through our building commissioner. He, uh, Roger Early spoke with um, the cigar store over on Pulaski. They were asking if they could open, open up a hookah bar at the old Dunkin' Donut. Uh, and um, per our ordinances... We double checked, and um, hookah bars are prohibited in the village of Elsip. Obviously, um, in public places, there's no smoking. Um, there are a couple in other communities. I'm not sure how those got there. They might have been grandfathered for whatever reason. I just want to let, let this group know. Should you be asked about that, um, we Roger, we informed them that it, it's against yes, ordinance, right? Okay. Um, also, I am still working on what I brought up at one of our last meetings. Is a um, I double checked all the criteria for um, the Clean Air Act in Illinois. Because we're still we were still trying to identify with what we could do to assist any of the residents on the west side of town near some, one of the larger trucking companies. 
and um, I might have been Trustee Pierce that brought this up before, but the uh, Illinois Vehicle Code um, with regard to excessive idling, and I double-checked about four different, five different websites, and they all said the same thing just to confirm. But in the state of Illinois, in Cook County, uh, they have a time limit of 10 minutes within any 60-minute period, 30 minutes uh, a truck can idle within any 60-minute period if they're waiting to weigh or load or unload freight. There's no limit when it comes to temperatures less than 32 degrees or more than 80 degrees. Typically, uh, fines run from $50 for the first conviction to 150 for the second and subsequent uh, convictions within a 12-month period. But then you get to exemptions. And for anything less than 8,000 pounds, uh, traffic conditions or, or, or controls prevent of safety or health or emergency by law enforcement, service or repair, government inspection, power takeoffs involving, involving cargo or work functions, and, and every one of them confirmed is resting in a sleeper berth. So should a truck be waiting for a load to come into one of these terminals, that is an exemption that they allow. Should somebody not be behind in that truck or in a sleeper, certainly they qualify for the, the fines that we're talking about here. Um, Building Commissioner Roger Early did reach out to one of the residents that brought a lot of this to our attention. And Roger, he's supposed to get a hold of you this week. We're going to have a meeting with him. We are going to have a meeting this week. Okay. So I just want to get the board apprised of that, that we are working to see what we can do in that respect. Um, on your agendas, the first item I had on here, it was just for discussion, was uh, what I put on here was a discussion to hire one staff accountant for the finance department. And I had just suggested a salary of roughly 47500 That would actually equate to about $22.83 per hour for a staff accountant. Um, I actually had, I asked uh, Shanae Hunter, our HR manager, to do a salary um, comparative just to see if we were uh, in that right ballpark for salaries. And on here, what she brought back to me was, and, and Shanae, thanks for doing this too, by the way. So anyone, uh, let's say for a staff accountant with with no experience to two years of experience, that salary, and she used, like, let's see, six different resources here uh, from salary.com, Glassdoor, Robert Half, uh, Salary Expert, and a couple others. That salary went was valued at anywhere between $45,500 to $54,100. For someone that had two to four years' experience, went anywhere from $51,000 as high as $75,000. The lowest cost uh, offered by these services was by Glassdoor. Many people might be familiar with Glassdoor. It's a popular online uh, job finding source. So, and uh, that was actually, yeah, a zero to two year person. Could be somebody right out of college, maybe even somebody semi retired. It could be anybody for that matter, but. Um, Again, with with a skill set, obviously this is a, a valued skill set that this person would have, would be known as a staff accountant one or an entry-level accountant. And as I said, anyone with the uh, two to four years experience, uh, all of these agencies rank them as what they call a staff accountant two, which obviously has more responsibility to it. Um, I have brought this issue up. This would be the third time I'm bringing it up. And... Um, I know our finance director, Mr. Alvin, he had issued an email out to everybody uh, just with an explanation of what he thought was pertinent to consider uh, by the board. I highlighted a few things. I'd like to just run through these quickly. Um, basically, he put out a memo to everyone just to provide details of some of the ways that finance has not been able to keep up with proper operations, which is why we need the help. And I'm, I'm asking even more so than he is. I, I've been here for a little over eight months now, and I see the deficiency in this department, even for all practical purposes. I brought this up before. Um, you have one accountant right now, one finance director, one HR person, and one accounts payable person. Sometimes you risk a lot for the practical things in life. And you say, for instance, anyone got sick 
uh, if any were injured and couldn't come to work for a couple of months, that kind of thing. There's not a lot of resources left when you have to rely on the next person in that same office to do the work of, of the person that's out. Um, I don't feel we're overstaffing. I just think that we need the coverage that we need on a practical side. On operations side, which Mr. Alvin outlined for everybody, he basically was saying that he's having difficulty in getting out an audit in a timely manner because of the volume of work it entails. I can tell you he sees, sees me and everything he's doing with the auditing firm right now. This is very intensive. This goes back and forth, back. It's red line, green line. There's all kinds of changes, which the changing standards that need to be maintained and because of the poor shape of an audit, when he arrived, just, you know, he's basically still trying to work through these programs right now. Uh, also note these standards change all the time, and almost 20 years later, we're still, what is, Kent, I'm sorry, what is Statement 87, what does that represent again? I don't know which one 87 is, but we, you and I were just working on, that. that's how the statement level they're at now. Um, that one probably ha is been passed but hasn't taken effect yet. The one that we would just work on was 77, okay. which was new, um, new, new disclosures on tax abatement. So we have one in property tax and one in sales tax. So we were having to do new wording on that. There's constant standards like this. Okay. Uh, in the past, Mr. Alvin's utilized part-time help. He's had uh, administration help. He's had just part-time people in general. None of them have ever stayed. I think part of the common goal is uh, once they had an opportunity to find full-time employment, they all left. Uh, the auditors have commented in the prior years that there have been that there should be reviews of bank re reconciliation process, journal entries, audit entries. Yet finance has never had staffing levels to do all of those, and in, plus internal controls, control practices. Uh, this year, it is expected there will be the following additional comments by the auditor that the Village only books its activity for the fire and police pension funds on an annual basis um, in the ERB, which is our accounting system. And number two, there's almost $1.5 million liability that's been on the village's books for over a decade. And although the village accountant and water commission had little information on this, the transaction was prior to their current positions as well and does not fully explain the entry. And I think, and, and Trustee Zalzal, maybe I, I reach out to you. Rick, do you remember, uh, and we've been here since 2000, maybe Trustee McGrill would, would recall as well, too. Do you remember we had, a, it was brought up to us years ago that there was a project that we were involved in with Cook County. And there was probably a water line that had street resurfacing, and I could have swore this came up. On Ken, Street. Yeah, and Kent's been here for three years, has no documentation on this. And they haven't well, been asking, but it's still on our we, books. We found uh, uh, Mr. Tribin found some draft um, work that we're not sure if the board ever passed, so we're trying to sort that out. But this is that draft work was years after um, this thing was booked. It's been over a, a decade since this has been booked, so it's it's a mystery. We've gained little pieces of it. Um, the clerk's office is helping, working with us. The mayor's office is working with us. We're just trying desperately if anyone has any information on this. But this is just one one journal entry out there. It's a big one in a million and a half dollars, but there's lots of these types of things that need researching, and we just we don't get to them, and they're years old. Uh, right now our, our accountant is trying to close funds. They've had no activity in them for um, over 10 years, over a dozen years, and she can't get these things closed because of old journal entries that are clogging them. Exactly. And, and I had told them the same thing that, you had just said, uh, Trustee Dalzell, is I remember this coming up years ago, and he kind of been, and obviously all of us roles now than we were then. We weren't involved in, in the operations, but yet you haven't had any communications with the state since you've been here for three, or the county, I should say, for the last three years, and yet this still lays on our books. So my, uh, my assistant, Becky, is going through all the, the minutes since 2010 to 14 looking for this. We can't find this yet anywhere, and we don't know what the previous administration might have did with this yet, too. But this is just one example. They could have picked it could dozens have been paid. and dozens of they other examples. It. That's what I thought. I said, but he can't find evidence of it. Yeah, we did pay it. We're, we're going to send our accounts payable person who's part-time out to the, the garage and look through all bankers' boxes and see what they can, she can find. Exactly. So, Mayor? 
Yes. Can you, um, how many people are in the finance department again? Can you name those? Uh, right now you have an accountant, mm -hmm. you have a finance director, an HR person, and an accounts payable person. That's it, right? Yeah, and the account, accounts payable person is part-time. Part-time. And does um, both accounts payable and payroll. Um, HR, uh, the mayor is saying HR, uh, that's based on the historical and what he's used to, but HR no longer reports to uh, finance. So we have a full-time accountant, myself, and a part-time payroll slash AP person. Thanks for correcting that. <laughs> Uh, the other, the other highlights I had on here was um, debt I issuance. You know what, Ken? Um, I'll just finish with, um, in, even in the debt issuance, it was that your predecessor had asked for another accountant, um, and that you had talked with, you had talked with the finance committee, open up an audit online and prepare yourself. And the first thing that you saw were that some of the bonds, like when you first came on board with the village. Some of the bonds could have been possibly refunded or advanced refunded years prior. Uh, doing so requires a lot of work, and um, that may not have been done by your predecessor, right? Right. Uh, why don't you take it from there? Go ahead. You can finish the explanation for this. Well, a lot of what's happening is it's um, our credit rating. Uh, in, we have two credit rating agencies who review us, and one of the two uh, dropped us in ratings last year. And so we've been, I've been working a lot um, with the rating agencies on an annual basis, uh, probably 80 hours a year, trying to prepare for annual co calls with them. Um, and they, they're not allowed to officially say, but they've been indicating that um, without more improvement, we're going to be dropping down. So we need to do everything we can to signal. Now, obviously, um, I've got a good conversation with them uh, based on the tax levy uh, that work that uh, the village board did. But we don't have uh, what they need in terms, what they expect from a quality organization in terms of financial policies, having a budget document that's more than just a spreadsheet. So you have a, a separate, what is it, what is the strategic planning that the board wants to do? How does the, this budget reflect it? What are the departments facing in the short term that this budget's dealt with? What's it facing in the long term? Um, what is, what's the capital plan look like more than just numbers? What are their financial policies? Um, these are the types of documents that it, you didn't used to need, and they're not laws. It's not a law that you have to do these things, but we're moving past where the laws are and more to what the bond market is expecting, what the Reddit, you know, people who might buy our bonds, people who currently hold our bonds and might trade them, um, and people in the credit rating agencies. Without spending the time to get all of that stuff in shape, a, one drop of our credit rating um, is huge in terms of dollar amounts when you go out to bond, or whether you refinance, or even if you buy... Um, we, we've got in our budget, as we went last year, we have um, fire trucks. We don't have the cash to do fire trucks right now. We're trying not to do dump trucks um, by going out to leasing, but historically we have vehicles that size, we have these. So our credit rating they, uh, matters even when we're buying vehicles. And so it, it's really important to get that signaling. But with regards to the, the um, best practices, all of the the financial policies, that's huge. I mean, there are so many of them. And I'll, I'll tell you another way besides um, the, how the credit rating agencies look at this. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Chief Miller right now uh, is working on the funding for um, 911. There's a grant uh, when the dispatch was consolidated in that state law that was funding for that. And um, the first round of funding wasn't prioritized to the municipalities in Cook County, but we're getting to the point where the funding um, might be grant eligible. And I was working with him uh, last week. Um, there's all sorts of new standards in terms of reporting uh, to, in order to get grants tons and tons of new reporting that didn't used to have to be. Um, the GATA 
stuff. I, I don't know. Uh, Trustee Dissell knows this, but it's the Governmental Accounting Transparency Act, I believe. And it is a lot of questions. And a good portion of them are based on things like internal controls. So they're asking what your financial policies are, what your training is, what your fraud training for everybody in the village um, is on an annual basis, what it looks like. Well, there isn't. Um, what the, whether or not you've got levels in your procurement policies, et cetera, that meet not just state standards, but it's actually the federal standards because a lot of these grants actually uh, frequently come from the federal government through the state or the county to us. And I have to say, um, there's a lot of questions and we had a lot of notes. And I'm hoping that we don't end up losing grants, including this 911 funding, which is potentially six-figure grants for lack of ever having had financial policies. Um, we do have a small amount of financial policies for the procurement, but not for procurement, for paying checks. Um, that's almost the extent of our financial policies, and that was written so long ago, it's poorly done. It doesn't meet any federal standards. It doesn't meet yellow book standards, et cetera. So if we can't get to the level um, where, you know, the, the standards are getting higher and higher, and again, it's not a law, but if you want grants, you have to start meeting these standards. And this year has more questions on internal control and expectations than last year's, which was the first year. Every year it's going to get more. Um, it happens with the Illinois Department of Insurance questions for the pe uh, pensions. Every year, the standards get harder and harder. Um, so these are the types of things where we can lose money by not being able to uh, keep up and not having the best practices that we should have. We are very, very far behind on that. And it's no longer saying, well, we always used to be able to do it because we got a budget out and we got an audit out. Yes, that makes meets the state requirements, but it doesn't meet the standards that are now necessary to function. Um, I do want to say, um, I overstated and slightly misspoke last time. I want to give my uh, accountant an apology if I inferred uh, that she was not doing her job. Um, we have some uh, accounts that are do take a few months behind uh, to get to, but that's during the audit season. And that's because we only have one accountant and she can't do absolutely everything. So um, some of the bank statements get behind during that period. Um, but, um, but they are reconciled on a regular basis. Um, but again, there's, there's all the counting that we need to be able to have time to research. So I didn't want to, I want to back up. I didn't mean to imply anything there, that she's not doing her job, but she's just one person. And we have more work than that. Thank you. Board, any questions? I mean, like I said, I just put down a suggested salary, and I was just doing some quick math here. If we even if we went with the lower salary of, of what the um, HR put together at forty five five is basically a dollar less an hour. It would be twenty one eighty an hour to do something like that, and to be in compliance with what the study brought to us was. If, there, if folks are interested in doing that, I put it on next week's agenda for approval. <coughs> But I really think, like I said, I wouldn't be pushing this hard, and it wouldn't be a third time asking if I didn't think we needed it. I, I mean, I see, I see a weak spot. I see a deficiency, and it's the hub of our community, of, of our village hall, is is our finance. I really think we need the strength. And, and I, Mayor, I appreciate that, that you're going there. But we started, um, and, and I know I'm not in the same place as, as uh, for instance, uh, my my commission, my my um, finance committee chair, um, but. The, the dollar amount, I think, does does matter. I, we started at the budget hearing um, at 58. We ended up at 50, and I'm I'm very reluctant to be at the very bottom of the the um, the pay scale because the other thing we have going for us is we're governmental accounting, and the job opportunities within if you narrow yourself in governmental accounting versus the business world, which has different standards. Um, I'm worried about being at the very bottom of that that scale. So. I get it, and and again, that's why I said it's somewhere between forty-five and fifty-four thousand dollars a year. The board can certainly decide what they're comfortable with. Well, so my biggest issue, though, is that even with the salaries that were provided by HR, that doesn't take into account the total benefit package. I mean, we're talking. I mean, if you're just looking straight line salaries, 
Yes, that's one thing. But when you factor in the amount of vacation time and sick time and all the other benefits that the village provides, mm -hmm. that has a value. Sure. And so I, I do, and I mentioned it to you, Mayor, and to Kent. I, I absolutely cannot agree to anything over twenty dollars an hour. And that's that's from my perspective, being an accounting professional and working in that environment. You have to assign the value of the benefits as well to the job. And I can, I, I, mean, I totally agree that Kent needs help. But the benefits do have a value, and I, I'm also spending a lot of time right now um, researching the value of college degrees and because as I said my, my son is getting ready to go into college and so I've spent a lot of time in that area as well and what the expected starting salaries are coming out of school and forty thousand dollars a year is a completely acceptable number in my mind so twenty dollars an hour would put you to about forty one thousand six hundred yep right mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, Trustee Wars, any, any thoughts on it? No. How about this side? Anybody? I guess I was looking for, uh, regardless of what my thoughts are, obviously, you know, we, um, I'm, oh, I'm all ears as far as what anyone's recommendation may be. I mean, if someone thinks it should be higher, lower, whatever, you know, I mean, like I said, I'd, I'd, I'd like to put this on the agenda next week. Uh, to ask the board for approval on this, but it's kind of looking for a little support as far as where we're going to be salary-wise. As the idea of committee means is to have those discussions, because otherwise I can throw any fictitious number <laughs> on there, you know. And it's like, as Kent said, you know, I mean, he's he's fishing in one pond, I'm in another right now, and stuff and too. But I'm certainly willing to be flexible with this board because I understand the need for this thing, and I don't, I, you know, I understand too that even on the, at this end with this particular skill set. Um, I certainly would like the opportunity to give somebody, uh, again, somebody that's got a degree coming out of college, it's a great opportunity for somebody to come into the workforce. But I understand there's benefits that go with it, and I'm not saying that's the person it's going to be. We might find somebody looking for a job. We might find somebody um, that's semi-retired. Who knows? It's all over the board. But we need to kind of come to a consensus as far as where we want to be with a salary for this person. So, I mean, obviously, it, it, what you put out the position description, and you're looking at what the required uh, education is or experience. Uh, I mean, nowadays, uh, a person who's got a CPA has a, a master's degree along with it. Sure. So, there's a, the, cost, the cost for that. <coughs> but we aren't yeah, asking oh, you're not for, a for a CPA, CPA. or a no. master's. Right. So. There's no way we're. Right. So, I mean, this could come down to obviously a further discussion next week as far as salary. Um, like I said, you know, we're, I'm a few bucks over, I'm a dollar over what the study said. I'm obviously, I'm a, I'm a couple of bucks over with what um, Trustee McLaurin was just recommend, recommending as well. So, um, it shouldn't even, let's put it this way, we've got a whole week. So if anyone has any suggestions, please send me an email this week, okay. and um, maybe we'll rally, or I'll, I'll give everybody a call. We could talk more about it and stuff then, too. I don't want to put everybody in front of a, uh, up in front of a firing squad to get this done. I mean, I know this has been a long time coming. Kent's been here for three years. He's asked every year for one of these. Uh, myself, even as a trustee, I agreed to this a you know, at least a couple of times because I have to have confidence in, in a professional at atmosphere that we have. And he's pointed out these deficiencies in the past as well then, too. But now being here every day and seeing how this is uh, happening and all the work that happens there, uh, his department does a great job. These people work very, very hard up there and stuff, and we need to support them. And we, we, need, we can't afford not to. Well, we have to take advantage of opportunities, as you said, with grants and so forth. We have to keep moving forward on these kind of things. And, uh, again, we almost have to make personnel available to support the other departments that are bringing these forward yet too, but you got your own things. You're in and day with day-to-day -day operations. Something else comes in, or we got to have people that can assist these uh, our other departments to get these done. That, that's a good point. Finance, the way I've always run a finance department, and again, this is my fourth municipality, is finance is customer service, and it's customer service not just to outside people, but it, it just as importantly to inside departments. We're not. We do our best at what we can do there. Uh, but we don't 
we could be given better customer support to our other departments and we just in our staffing level we were limited there i speak for all departments just about every day and uh you know they all nobody doubts the efforts of finance and so forth but we need to support them that's all um all right well thank you uh moving forward then to the second thing on everyone's agenda was i had a discussion for approval of a franchise agreement with comcast and i did get notice from both comcast and attorney joe kankar they're trying to iron out the final details that originally we were asked just to uh, to approve a mirrored idea of what we did 10 years ago but there is some new language right now that joe kankar felt was relevant and he's trying to work that out with comcast right now so i should have that ready hopefully by next week we'll see what happens um clerk's report trustee petzel <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to steal all everybody's okay. thunder here and stuff. You know, so. No worries. Um, there's, in the packets were three sets of minutes for the October 2nd, 2017 Village Board Meeting, the October 9th, 2017 Village Committee Meeting, and the October 16th, 2017 Village Board Meeting. If there are any adjustments, if you would get them to Erica by Thursday, um, I am reviewing them as well. There may be some minor changes, but I'm not expecting anything drastic. Um, accept, uh, presentation for the acceptance of the IDOT motor fuel tax allotment for December 2017 in the amount of $42,595.38. Um, I handed out in paper and it will be included in the board packet for next week the presentation of the December 2017 FOIA report. There were 27 requests in December. Um, and then just informationally, um, there's an election day coming up on March 20th, so there will be early voting here at Village Hall again from March 5th to the 19th, so there will be more information coming about that. And then lastly, we are working through the vehicle stickers, um, the design, the colors for the tags for vendor licenses and pet tags and all that happy stuff. Um, there will be a minor update to the ordinance uh, that needs to be done, and it is in reference to the purchase of a late sticker. Um, Trustee Pierce, do I bring that to you once we solidify what it is to put through? For ordinance legislation. Ordinance legislation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it's, it's just something minor. There's uh, when it was adjusted last year for seniors and disabled prices for when they were purchased on time, um, when it went to verbiage as far as purchasing late, what that fee would be, there was an error there, so we want to get it corrected ahead of time. So we'll be bringing that to you here before the end of February, I would assume, so that we're all buttoned up before we go to sticker season. And, and sometimes there are disabled and senior, and it wasn't clear whether or not that meant two or there's just some clarification. Right. It's, right just, it's just minor, but we want to try to get ahead of it this year. So. Um, that is all I have, Mayor Ryan. Thanks. Uh, we have the public forum. Would anyone wish to address the board this evening? Come on, we got a new mic up there. Nobody wants to use it. <laughs> <You know? coughs> and they were in there testing that thing today. It works great. Um, and I'm glad we still had the uh, opportunity to rewire that, too. It seemed like with the uh, um, wireless mic microphones, obviously, we've all seen everybody fooling around with those and almost had it against your lips to talk. That one works really well. So. <coughs> just putting it out there anybody sees the need please use it um next standing committee finance committee trustee mclaurin under finance i will have a list of payroll and a list of accounts payable that's it okay thanks next uh fire committee trustee mclaurin under fire I'd just like to announce that we've got uh fire fire testing coming up um just some key dates for the public to be aware of advertising and application start date will be on wednesday march 14th Completed applications will be due by Wednesday, April 11th at 4 p.m. And processing and review then will begin on April 12th. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. um, I know the chief mentioned there's four upcoming retirements in the very near future. Right. Possibly five. And we're, we're working on that right now too. That um, um, we're going to put together. By April 11th. We're going to put together. When I'm, I'm working on a study right now of looking. Um, I, I won't. I'll, I'll wait for the chief to speak for himself. But we're looking at some financial studies on what's the best 
um, savings possibly for us, but at the same time, what's feasible? Chief says he can bring on four guys at once. I want to look at what the optional cost is overtime-wise, and we'll see which one shakes out the best. Okay. Uh, Trustee, what I wanted to bring up, too, and actually Chief Stasinski called me earlier today, and Kent, I had deferred to you the other day, regarding Caltron cost. Now, now they used to come out of a 911 fund that we're really not going to have access to anymore now then, too, to buy Caltron boxes and so forth. How, how are we going to fund that? Do you know off the, off the top of your head? Or how right. My guess is Caltron is going to roll straight into the general fund, both the uh, revenues and the expenditures. I, this afternoon, this morning, rather, I had um, Heather pull up a quick stat for me just to see what we spent on Caltron equipment just for like a year's worth. So she brought up, this is um, from March 31st, 2016 to a April 3rd, 2017, we spent approximately, well, we did spend $163,000 on Caltron equipment. So while we purchased the equipment, Crosspoints is just a supplier and they service the equipment, correct? That's my understanding. But because we're the ones that are ultimately responsible for collections all the time is because we operate this equipment then too. Yes. Okay. I think, and again, unfortunately the Chief's not here this evening, and I apologize, I didn't tell him I, I wanted to address this, but I think um, we really need to put some thought into how far we want to keep pursuing Keltron. I mean, do we stay with this program? Do we Do we keep doing this? I mean, last year... This actually lost a little bit of money, and we lost, I think, $5,000 last year and stuff. So I don't want to, you know, initiate a conversation without the chief being here and stuff, but I want the board to think about it. I think we should bring this up at an upcoming committee meeting and see if we're going to keep doing this or what, because this is a lot of work, and we just brought on a, an assistant to help him pursue all these at, too, at the same time. If it's the choice of the board to keep on, so be it, that kind of thing. But I think we need to look at how much work and cost is involved with this Caltron program right now. And I know the chief is struggling with a lot of these businesses. What came to mind recently was um, folks that are in arrears, um, you know, we they wanted to suggest, I think Trustee McLaurin, you pulled it off a, a few weeks back, it was pulling business licenses at some point, you know, where there's actually a process that, like, and we can't just pull a business license. You have a hearing with the mayor, and actually only the mayor can suspend or pull your business license from you then, too. But that's the point we're reaching with some of these businesses. They are in arrears right now with this with this program. So I think we need to have the chief come in maybe at our next committee on the 12th and talk some more about this then, too, because he's concerned about the funding for this program right now as well then, too. Yeah, I, I, I don't know whether or not we it pays for itself, doesn't pay for itself. I hadn't seen the, the numbers. It's probably my staff that, that did that for you. I will say when it comes to capital-intensive businesses, where it's equipment oriented, um, I wouldn't just look at one year because sometimes you'll have a year where there's a lot of equipment, something's broke, and you need to replace a whole bunch of something at once or get a whole new set of boxes, or maybe the room it's monitored and needs air conditioning unit because that's broken. Other years you might not. So um, things like labor is more consistent, but sometimes the capital gets, it jumps up and down mm -hmm. a bit. Um, there's, there's also intrinsics that are involved with that. So the original proposal for the Caltron was that it would save our businesses money. Never was the case. Mm -hmm. and, and we've amended our fees downwards to facilitate that better, but I still don't believe that we're competitive and that we're doing our businesses a service mm -hmm. because fire safety is mandatory to where they have to have a hookup to our system. We're forcing those businesses to purchase the alarm monitoring service from us at a price higher than they could probably get it out in the general market. So with us purchasing the hardware and trying to get X number of years out of that hardware, the maintenance of it, it, it hasn't been a good pr proposition for us, nor for the businesses. Now, the intrinsic side is is that it's a better monitoring system than the old phone lines were. So for that, maybe we have less false alarms, therefore less false runs, so less cost or, or effort on the fire department side. 
but that's an intrinsic that we might be able to say that there's a dollar value to, but we'll never be able to assign a true dollar value to that. And on top of that as well, I don't know, I mean, alarm companies are getting away from the old phone lines anyway. Right. Right. So it, there's no... Phone companies we, get away from those. Right. <laughs> so Caltron isn't necessarily the only provider that would prevent, do the service in this manner. We, I mean, I'm sure there are other alarm companies out there that, like you said, can provide the service at a lower rate. And so if the village has no real absolute benefit that we can quantify, then I see no reason why we should be enforcing this on our businesses. I agree, did. And we had broached that information with the chief. And, you know, like you say, the unfortunate thing is it's not quite fair to throw things back and forth when I'm sure that he could come in with some better facts and figures. Yeah. I, go ahead. I will say finance would be willing to, uh, back to customer service, we'd be willing to help run numbers, but we would need to know, understand, I think a lot of this possibly is labor. And we don't know how their labor is allocated. You know, we know who's working what days, but we don't know what portion of someone's day or what portion of a week that they're working on Caltron versus working on something else. So I don't know how helpful finance would be. If fire, if fire gave us, you know, this is how many labor hours that we put on this, and these are the people who are doing it, I think we could probably well, he, come he out already said that. That's the reason why we agreed to hire a person to facilitate the building aspect of it. But here again, now we're adding more labor to it in order to accommodate the, the invoicing. And then now we're going to go to the nth degree based upon what he had proposed by sitting there and creating yet another ordinance to make mandatory compliance and, and withhold a business's ability to conduct business in our town because they owe us money. Right. And I don't know if billing is the only part of the labor that they're putting forward. I don't know how many hours of labor that they put forward at the 7G rate, which is one of their overtime rates. We don't have that information in finance. If we could get that information, we could help them model if they would, if they pay or the board's request. Well, I'll, I'm going to ask Chief to obviously be here at our next committee meeting, and I think it just I wanted to set the table for at least discussion and ask the board to really, you know, take a look at your notes and, and decide what you think is good. And um, I'll have the chief get us some numbers, or please ask for what you think you may need in the meantime. But um, I'm not saying anything either way at this point. I mean, the board makes quite a few it makes, uh, decisions here with me as a tiebreaker on these decisions, but ultimately... Uh, I just hate to heavy hand a lot of these businesses. That's where I'm at with this. You know, is the point that we've got existing businesses in town that we've basically cut off from. Like they might be alarm companies that we won't even participate in their own in, where they do business here because they, you know, we're sole sourcing this equipment and stuff. Then too, you know, you could have ADT, you could have quality, you can have all these different guys, and uh, unfortunately, they all feel that we're monopolized on the product. And we're not letting them in on this on this action then too, you know. That and ultimately then too, as Ken just said, and we all aware of, here we just hired a, a second secretary over there just to monitor these kind of things, and um, it's growing. It's not getting smaller. It's it's actually gotten a little bit bigger. Does a business have the ability to get a third party vendor to provide fire alarm monitor fire alarm monitoring to their business in our town? Not currently because of contract. Well, we are monopolizing. Yeah. And and that's the thing. I mean, you know, like anything else in this world, you, you can take a company of your choice. You might have ADT at your home for home security, and you want to allow them to do your business the same way. Well, you can't, you know, because, uh, because of the program that we have in play. I You can't put a price on safety. We all know that. And I think the idea and the concept is, fan is great, what they've got in mind here. But... When we keep seeing these numbers, we've been seeing this for a couple of years now, of how badly uh, some of these businesses, Trustee Dodge all just pointed out, that they're falling behind schedule to the point where we're going to start yanking their business license where they can't open tomorrow. That means you're still not going to get paid, you know, unless you're, you're heavy-handed in these folks to get it done, which is why I'm asking the board to consider, let's have a conversation with the chief. And um, I, I know he's beat, this, he's beat this horse forever in a day, to say, you know, what what can be done, and there's not many more avenues. And we're kind of reaching the end of this to make a decision. 
and it seems like it's unfair because this has been in play for decades as far as this program is concerned. So we can't be refunding things to people either. You know, while you got some people there in arrears and some not, do we keep pushing this envelope? Well, the other problem is, is that if we do abandon this program, what do we do with our our stock? And I think, if memory serves me correctly, is that he just purchased a bunch of new radios. He paid. No. All right. I think the radios. Uh, I don't. I don't think we did buy radios just recently. We did for the police, and not for the fire side. Uh, I believe we bought more Keltrons. Oh. So, anyway. Uh, I can. I'll reiterate this to, to Chief Szynski, and we'll we'll follow up with this with the next committee meeting on February 12th. Well, we can have a talk then with the chief. Trustee, anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Uh, police committee, Trustee McGrill. I have a presentation of a list of bills and a presentation of the timesheets. That's all. Uh, pu thanks. Public Work Committee, Trustee Juarez. I have a presentation of a list of bills and a presentation of timesheets. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Building Committee, Trustee Zelensky. I have a presentation of a list of bills and timesheets <coughs> also. That's not listed on here, but they, they came in. I got an email from them earlier. So okay. That's all I got. Thanks. Uh, next, Water and Sewer Committee, Trustee Dalzell. I, too, will be presenting employee time records, <laughs> list of bills, and then uh, also their presentation of an engineering proposal from Robinson Engineering for the Pulaski TIF water main replacement that involves a new 8-inch main from 117th to 120th place on Pulaski, and that will encompass the replacement of the main, hydrants, valve vaults, service lines, and buffalo boxes. Anything else you want to add to that? That is actually um, considerably less than what we budgeted for in the TIF. Um, and then Kent and I also did discuss um, the apportionment of that uh, project. Um, I think we came up to 75% from the TIF and 25% from water funding just to accommodate the TIF you know, for other future projects you may have. So if that's acceptable to the board. Damn. <laughs> Damn. I went to the wall for you, buddy. I, I know you did, and I, I just don't want to be uh, it's very agreeable draining me. the bank. You know? Thanks, <laughs> All right, and then also uh, discussion with regard to the bidding of the South Water, uh, South Pumping Station, uh, Foundation Repair and Floor Resurfacing. Dan has passed out to uh, all very colorful pictures of uh, very poor flooring. Yeah, so I just Maybe received. Maybe washed a little more often. Made a little wax. Yeah, that's uh, that's as clean as it gets. <laughs> um, the I did receive um, from our engineer an estimate for the repairs to the foundation, and this is the portion we didn't know about or have a cost estimate during budgeting, but that is a considerably larger dollar amount um, at $110,000 additional to the $30,000 for the floor resurfacing. So we're at $140,000 for the project. And so you can see at the bottom of there, um, I've highlighted a couple of items that I feel we can reprioritize in order to get this project done this year. It's something that does need to be done to uh, affect the repairs that are needed and requested by the IEPA during their engineering evaluation of our facilities there. So um, you can see the pump repairs and uh, master meters that I had about $95,000 appropriated for. I can certainly put those off to next year and try to get this project you know, done since we have this one lined up. So you'd rather swap out than make a budget, budget amendment? Currently, I think that, I mean, I, I, getting this project done and putting the, the other two projects off for four or five months until next fiscal year is, you know, okay with me. I mean, we can certainly look at a budget amendment as well. But even even so, I, I think our, our budget is in good shape where I wouldn't be going over either way. But I just wanted to let you know that's 
you know, the additional cost, you know, as initially was $33,000 it appropriated for the floor. Right. And these foundation repairs are extensive. And it, that's why it took so long even just to get a design was finding the right, you know, materials to work with potable water, you know, to make these repairs. Okay. Any questions of Dan for that? That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Next, the license committee, Trustee Juarez. I have a presentation of a list of licenses. That's all. All right, thank you. Uh, the economic development committee, Trustee Pierce. Uh, everyone in the board packet uh, received the very lengthy, detailed um, <laughs> redevelopment agreement for 11640 to 58 South Pulaski Road, uh, also known as Fire Water Barbecue. So this is going to be on the agenda for next week's um, next week's meeting for approval um, if you have any questions on this uh, on this agreement please contact myself the mayor or uh, Roger or Chris and this is already passed through legal you came from legal yes All right. it, it, that was actually a, uh, only in, until this is approved we can't discuss the numbers just yet but um, everyone got a copy of this per email uh, for your review of them too at the same time Okay. Uh, and then uh, Roger's here um, just to give us a couple updates on the Pulaski Road TIF, including um, the health and wellness plans and options, which is uh, not insurance health and wellness. <laughs> yeah, we've had a number of discussions with uh, health and wellness, the chiropractors. I forgot a word. That's what it was. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Trustee McGreal wanted to know why I was putting health and wellness options on TIF when that's a insurance discussion. <laughs> Leave one word out and, you know. It means something else. Yeah. Well, anyway, Sorry, Roger. What, what we're proposing now, I mm. guess, to try to accommodate the chiropractor is that we um, use uh, the TIF grant not as a grant so much but as a forgivable loan. So we would loan the money, $250,000, to the chiropractor, and then he would be under the obligation to repay it in one of two ways. One way would be just to simply make a payment on it, like he is on his mortgages. But the other option we would give him is that he could reduce those mortgage payments, which might occur maybe quarterly, by recruiting tenants for one of his two uh, vacant spaces that would be retailers, and that their sales tax then would be credited against uh, uh, reducing his obligation to repay the tip. And secondly, we would also give him the option that if he generated increased property taxes on the property above and beyond, you know, the threshold for that building, then uh, that would also contribute to forgiveness of the loan. So in that fashion, we would be recovering it one way or the other. Um, improvement for that property. One of the concerns I guess we've expressed about that property is that it only has about, I think, uh, 10 or 14 parking spaces. And the total retail area on the first floor is about uh, six or 7,000 square feet on a lot that's only um, a little larger than about 14, 15,000 square feet. So there just isn't the kind of <coughs> parking available to create a quick service restaurant and as we've learned that you know retailers just aren't uh, interested in those sort of properties we feel a, a chiropractor would bring additional wages and salaries to the corridor and then uh, renovate the building it's right in the middle of that last year of the and that would to the overall improvement of the corridor that would enhance the uh, adjoining Checkers restaurant, and in its uh, in its position there too, they could actually use the Checkers restaurant parking for some of their overflow parking for patients or employees, and they we've already structured that capability for them to uh, to use some of the Checkers parking. So uh, we wanted some direction. We'd like to put uh, an action on the agenda for the next meeting for the February. Subject to the doctor's uh, approval, to uh, to have you consider a forgivable loan. 
and the way would see that working is you know we would require him to complete the remodeling pay for it all be reimbursed by us and then about three months after it was completed then his sales tax revenues begin coming in and property tax revenues come in a year from now we would credit those against his repayment schedule you know Raj I went over recently and physically walked it and there are 14 parking spots over there which I know is still going to be thin for three part three retail parcels you know I hate to think that we're focusing too much on the finance aspect of this all the time when Valdi Bernanke came in here you know his big thing which I thought was very nice I mean obviously everyone sees what what a disaster the building looks like now are we still going to get that beautiful facade because I've heard it like I don't hear that being talked about very much right now and while we're focused on finance all the time are we getting that facade that we discussed because I don't hear that being mentioned yes we are okay that's a major part of the budget is the facade renovation for the entire building is to me that's that's exactly what that building needs is a, a huge shot in the arm to make this baby fly so um, but the, the premise of it is a professional service which isn't a sales tax base and then the remainder of it is going to be a sales tax base of retail sales mm -hmm. but because of the limited parking there's going to be a limited amount of retail sales or opportunities to fill that with retail sales so you, you might have a really pretty facade and two empty storefronts and, and I think it goes back to basically now you were saying because it's got apartments upstairs it's got a it's, can you explain that Roger to everybody again how that works but the apartments aren't apartments. aren't a part of the TIF aspect but it does lower how, do, how are we Here's talking about that as far as our payback I was, yeah, yeah, I was just going to ask where are they going to park yeah. it's because of the uh, property classification because having two apartments upstairs qualifies them for the class two uh, property tax classification which is essentially a residential for the entire building right so and again that's we know that already that's already the classification it operates under as well as it has a homeowner's exemption and a senior citizen exemption but with Dr. Vaught buying the property those two exemptions come off because he's not occupying one of the apartments right. as an owner occupant. Mm. Uh, I have to be careful on that because as a land is a landlord there is a way around that that's a common loophole that Well Dr. Vaught's not a senior citizen. I got it, but it doesn't have to be the owner is what I'm saying. There actually is in Cook County a loophole that a good portion of um, landlords know. So if it does get rented to them it's possible both of those properties can still go that route. I'm not willing to make that. And again, we, we could be it. potentially losing two to four parking spots because of that, yeah, too. If, yeah, I don't, I don't know how they're going to allocate their parking. I would assume they'd want it elsewhere. But. Well, I think the real thing you need to, you know, focus on is whether or not having an occupied building or a vacant uh, and a currently abandoned building is something that you want to know already paid to redevelop in the way of the streetscape along Pulaski Road. Mm -hmm. you know, but we're, we're trying, like heck, to try to fashion a program together that will enable yeah. this doctor to, to renovate the building. I believe that that building is not labeled as vacant and the property taxes are still being paid as if it weren't, but that won't be forever. It is going to be listed as vacant sooner or later uh, if it continues to be vacant and the property tax it, revenues from that are going to drop in a very large manner. How long would it take to recoup those funds, the TIF funds? <laughs> um, it's, um, well, to be honest with you, it's probably going to take the remaining 15 years of the TIF. 15, 18 years was the last one we saw. And how much is left on the TIF if, before doing this? Fifteen. No, no. How much? How much money is left? Fifteen years. How much yeah, money? How is much left? is left in the TIF? Um, the most recent number, after taking into consideration what we've already committed to, or pretty sure we're going to commit to, um, is that it'll be around five hundred thousand without this. It'd be around a quarter million with this. Um, if fire water, if when fire water, right now we're looking at fifty thousand a year being added to the TIF. Firewater would add another 50. So it would be essentially, if you did this, 
You're at a quarter million, going up a hundred thousand a year. I didn't think that we would see a great difference on the real estate tax side of this building. You you won't see a huge existing building going to a renovated building. Right. It's already it, in the tax roll. There there would be a little bit, but that's that's not that wasn't a Trustee Zielinski's question. His was what our fund balance would look like in the TIF. And the fund balance would be about a quarter million dollars with this other project that was discussed um, that we'd be looking at probably $100,000 being added to the TIF every year. Um, there are a few commitments to some of those monies. Um, and uh, one is a property tax uh, a sharing agreement we already have. Another is an IGA. But essentially that's the numbers. Now that current money also includes all the other facades we've allocated? It does, that that Alec, that includes the ones that we've already done recently or committed to recently, and it includes the one just to the south of the there that looked like uh, that we talked about as well. I think at some point I think the board needs to put this to rest with a vote anyway, whichever way this goes. I mean, we've been working with this you know, back and forth for six months probably now so, or, or so. So. I think he needs a decision. He was in here a few weeks ago, and I told him exactly that. You know, I mean, you know, just a small conversation we've had both ways. The board is a little bit all over the place on this, and I think he needs a decision for his investor to figure out which way to go with this right now. Then, too, they need some direction. So, um, just one other thing to report to: uh, back in October, you authorized a, a TIF grant for a renovation of the affiliated management property next to Pappas' restaurant. Um, their investors have all agreed to it. They've got the final bids all in place. They've sent me the identity and the ownership of the organization, and I forwarded that material on to uh, the village attorney, and he's in the process of drafting a redevelopment agreement for that project to get started. Now, that redevelopment agreement I'm proposing to bring back to you when, when the village attorney gets it completed, either... Um, for the February 5th meeting or the February 19th meeting. So. And, and that fund balance mm -hmm. does uh, include that. And that's a $187,000. And that was the facade, the driveway, and the new sign, right? Signage, right. right. It's new signage, uh, new parking, and uh, new facade for uh, the taco burrito store, the Chinese restaurant, the convenience store, the liquor store, etc. Can you, can you tell us the exact amount of that grant? That's uh, I, um, I don't have the wait a minute. for health and for our health and oh, wellness. Health and wellness, um, two hundred fifty thousand. But again, it, they're they're looking at whether or not that's going to be a forgivable loan, which is not the discussion that you've had up to this point. So there's some there's some personal backing to and some guarantees that weren't in there before. I think that uh, the village attorney is been looking at this differently uh, than he has before on that. Yeah, he's been more positive about a forgivable loan. You know, it's still, you still have to qualify the same way for all of the tip expenditure. You still have to abide by prevailing wages. You still have to submit uh, payrolls and other things. It may become a tip grant partially or, or um, entirely, depending on how he redeems it with sales and property taxes. So. so what are you asking for the agenda next Monday? What, what are we going to do? I think I think it's only fair to ask the board to decide if they want to support that or not. Put it down as a grant for $250,000, or are we going to put it as... R Roger explained to me earlier that this is a common practice with these grants, right? Yes. Okay. I've you know, we've used it um, several times in the city of DeKalb, where I'm from, and some of the other communities as well, too. I think, as, as uh, Trustee Zelensky was pointing out, though, too, I think um, it's just interesting to see that, you know, you can, this could take as long as 15 plus years to pay this back, I thought, too. And um, are we going to generate, as we all said here, out of 14 parking spots and three parcels of business? Are we going to even generate enough money? You know, I mean, I understand, like you said, that maybe that's, this is the more practical way of doing this, where he's got to put up, you know, he's basically putting up collateral. He's got to have credit to, to support the need for the loan. But um, 
he's on the hook regardless. So we're not just totally dependent on the sale and the sales tax at this point because he's guaranteeing a loan anyway and stuff then too. But it's up to us to decide if that's how we want to put that money, if that's where it's best spent, or do we need that for something else? Can we be patient enough to wait 15 plus years for for a payment back on this and stuff then too? You know, in the meantime, we will be getting incremental payments back. R right, but not like everyone thinks, especially when he's grabbing the largest parcel for a chiropractic practice. And is it the best fit? You know, I mean, you know, people have business ideas, and some people make well with them, and other ones don't. And if, if we were to go ahead with this, and those spots go unrented, maybe have a pretty facade, but you still have empty storefronts. Right. And in my opinion, because of the limited parking that's there, that really limits that opportunity. I'm agreeing with you. I mean, I just it's it's budgeted. It's totally, you know, when again, when you consider those apartments upstairs, which is why how it's taxed the way it is, you know, that's certainly a consideration. Right. So it's it's 14 spots, at least down to 12, maybe down to 10. Plus, by our ordinance, he has to have X number of handicap spots. So now it's down to eight. His business, his employees. Now you take away half of that again. So. Well, I say know. his proposal has four four positions right off the bat, with the possibility of an additional four. So you're talking potentially eight employees there. Right. And my, guess is my guess is they're not parking up front. They're yeah, they're going to have streets. That's In the jewel? Well, no, probably there's back streets. The but there's not a that. whole lot. There's not a lot of spaces on checkers no. either. There's back streets. There's maybe about five or six that they could use. And, and during the winter time, while it's snow on there. Did we? Obviously, you know, we, it seems like we cover every other base here, but. Roger, have we even covered that? I mean, we've looked at some of these aspects for other businesses for parking is a major component of approval. Have we looked at this to see if this is even, regardless of what was there and stuff then, too? We can only, you know, it's easy to say, well, that was there before. It couldn't have been much different now. But are they in compliance? Do you know? Because we've seen, you and I talked about a couple other parcels recently that by redesigning the parking, we can make things work, you know, that kind of thing. You can angle things, you can do a lot of different things. But in, right now on the surface, you don't think it, you don't even think it applies, or qualifies, I mean. Spots. I, I think in all fairness, I, I think this may be something we should just address one more time this week. Before we take this down to the to the finishing line, you know, and um, we'll, we'll certainly get your report back to all the trustees. It'd be great, all right? Because obviously, you know, there's no point in us getting up to the gate and we approved everything, and all of a sudden you go, "Oh gosh, darn it, we didn't we didn't look at this." So then, would you move this to the February 19th meeting instead, or you really want to vote on it? Yeah, I think he'd have an opinion for us this week, you know. <clears throat> But then how is it going to be listed on the agenda for approval of the of a a forgivable, loan. A forgivable loan? Well, you're going to have to look at it as plan A or plan B based upon the grant or the forgivable loan. Right. Let's confirm that. Make sure we, we cover all of our bases here, okay? All right. We'll present it as a forgivable loan, you know, in our memo, and then we'll... Uh, you know, say it's subject to uh, drafting of a redevelopment agreement that satisfies the village attorney and, and you know, Mike and the mayor. Yeah, so then what are we actually voting on? I mean, That's without a rede I'm... redevelopment agreement, we're not voting on anything. I mean, we're kind of just... Well, if you want to, I guess, hold off a quarter million dollars for that project. 
I mean, that's what he's, that's what the I ask is. The so if the ask is all right and, and you're comfortable with the premise, then it's quarter million dollars and how it's repaid to us, if at all, is almost immaterial. And that's part of the RDA. Yeah, you could be voting on whether or not the fraternity should put together an RDA because you're feeling comfortable with right. the project. It just seems to me at this point in time, until we get the numbers back, it's it's a round peg in a square hole. That would actually, Ken's correct, that would probably be the question to ask is, do we give permission to the attorney to, to draft an RDA agreement uh, based on our approval to move forward with this project or not? And that's it. So it's not the final approval because you'd still need an RDA, but is it worth spending the time to do an RDA? Right. Don't the, the, we have to have, to have direction what type of RDA? Round peg in a square hole. Fits. That's what you said. It's signaling. Thanks. It's signaling. Well, either will fit. Very it's the size hammer. of the hammer. <laughs> and, and, and I certainly don't want to throw a wrench in this at all either. Like, like I said, I was telling Roger before the meeting, we've had some positive conversations about this project, but, you know, again, darn it, you, know, you, you hate to think we, we did all this work and, you know, you choke on something as, as essential as parking. You know, if it doesn't have it, it doesn't have it. And we need to look at that. Especially when we're almost insisting that he brings in retail business. And as Trustee Dalzell said, you know, I mean, God forbid the guy that lives upstairs is stealing a couple parking spots and they can't even get anybody in there and stuff then, too. So, I mean, that's where we're at with this project right now then, too. Well, you'll right. help me draft the agenda item because I'm just confused. No problem. <laughs> All right. No, it's it's really I'll just send you, I'll send you a draft of the one. Yeah. Round peg <laughs> square <laughs> hole. <laughs> Big hammer. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Roger. It's okay. We have pictograms on the agenda. Is Trustee, that it? Uh, can I? Um, sure. If, if uh, Chairman will allow me here, um, going back to firewood, I just wanted to say give a quick update on a couple things. One, we didn't state it before, but there was, um, uh, because there's been purchase of land and there's about to be another one, on Wednesday we're going to close on the other piece of property. Uh, finance just, I worked on the wire today with the mayor, um, so that should close on Wednesday and we should have both those pieces of property. Um, the other is that there was the clerk's office with the attorney and with Mannheim Group um, worked on putting out something in the newspaper, looking for other businesses as part of the TIF. Um, if we have property and we're trying to do an RDA on it, we allowed anybody to come up and say, what's the best use? That was put out in the paper. The period closed uh, last week on that. We only had one, um, one applicant that was Firewater, and that's where we got to the RDA. So I just wanted to state that publicly. Uh, that the opportunity for that was open, and we had one applicant, um, and that's how we're that you're going to be seeing, uh, that you've seen a draft of, and that you're going to be voting on. Uh, but we will have those properties for that, and we're moving as fast as we can to close on the other end once we get the RDA passed. Thanks for doing that. Next, the Plan and Zoning Com uh, Committee, Trustee Zelensky. No report tonight, Mayor. No. I wanted to just add, Roger, regarding plan and zoning, did we just have something come up? Are we setting up a, a, a plan and zoning hearing for anybody coming up? Is it for, ju for justified? Okay. And Trustee McGreal, I'm gonna, you asked me a, a while ago for some info on that. I'll get that over to you and stuff then, too. I've had them at my desk. No, nothing's taken place. Place uh, actually, who's handling their paperwork? The guy just, he hasn't been feeling well. And I said, we got to get this up to speed. And, and he had to submit a request for rezoning and all that kind of stuff, which is why they're going to see these fellows now then, too. But I'll get you what you asked me for. I'll, I'll get that to you tomorrow and next day. All right, thank all right. you. I th I, it, we just want to make sure they were going to follow through there, so I'll get that over to you. So, okay, Rod, so they're going to set up a plan zoning hearing? Okay. Okay. So we'll be setting a date for that, because usually it's the second or last Wednesday of the month. Gotcha. Fourth Wednesday of the month, right. All right, thanks. Uh, next, special committee reports, Village Properties. Trustee McLaurin. Right. Under Village Properties, I've been approached um, by some residents at the 
at Heritage 2. Um, with a request, maybe Roger, you can chime in and give us some background. Um, what they're requesting is the ability to be able to rent the clubhouse, um, whether it be for a birthday party or some type of family or event. Um, but I guess currently, and maybe you can explain what we don't allow that. We only so, allow it to be used for the tenant's use only, not so that we throw parties there. I completely took that away years ago. They started to pack it with 300 plus people. Uh, there's not enough parking for that. There was a lot of issues with the clubhouse not being cleaned after they were throwing parties. Um, so I completely took the use of basically having parties there other than the tenants for the tenants only. Um, and I believe what they're asking, trust me, well, we're is to open that back up to it, which I would be against. Um, we have had issues presently even with the tenants coming down and having parties. They're not cleaning up after themselves. They're not taking care of out. If we want to staff it on a Saturday or Sunday, that's something that we can look into. But the garbage was sitting there Saturday, Sunday, Monday, come back on Tuesday, and there was a trail of ants throughout the clubhouse. And my suggestion would be to leave it the way that it is and hold the people accountable for the use of the and not open up to kind of having parties for family members or anybody else. How, how many such occasions were there where people were using that for? Before I put it into it, it would be quite often. And, and did they prearrange that, though, with you? They would prearrange it, and we would ask them to make sure that the clubhouse was put back in order. And at most of the times, they weren't. And a lot of times, they weren't even at that time. Which when I put it in place, we were would not allow it. They were just, there was an afterbirth party. We had no idea that it was going to take place. They came in and took over the clubhouse. I mean, it just seems to me that if you did like all the other places do, you have a deposit set, and if it's not in an acceptable condition, then that deposit is, is kept, or as the cost of the fee to, to have that as a rental, it, that includes the staffing of a person to make sure that things don't get out of hand and that person's responsibility is to uh, to clean up and build into the cost. Something we can look into to find out, you know, what we want to set a deposit at and maybe move forward with it or kind of keep it the way that it is. But yeah. I can definitely come up with a plan for it. I was going to suggest the same thing. If we established a reasonable deposit, security deposit on that, call it 150 200 bucks to make sure the place was clean properly, but at the same time, identify what the capacity is, obviously for the fire purposes and everything else, that no more than X is allowed to be used this facility. Uh, it, it does seem it does seem like a shame that we've got these beautiful clubhouses and maybe they're, they're being underutilized, I guess is my point. And the other issue you're going to have in the summertime is people are going to want to have parties there then. <clears throat> yeah. And use the pool. And you must be accompanied by a tenant. Gotcha. If people are throwing a party there, we're not going to have control over the pool area. I can see where that would be a problem, too, because to use the facilities, the washrooms, you have to come inside. And if somebody's got a function going on, it's like, well, the, the pool people are in here, and you got the other people. There's always going to be a conflict of some type yet, too. And what about serving alcoholic beverages at these? No, we don't do that. No. Right, well, that would have to be something would be specified in the rental. Okay. And, then, and maybe we have to go then as far as making a stipulation that there are no rentals during open pool hours. Yeah, I, I, I could see there's a lot of variables to this. <laughs> well, I think when you got to the part of uh, cocktails, I think that throws the kibosh on a lot of things then too. So 
Not that you have to have liquor at, at a function, but many times people like to have that, and that could be a, even a bottle of wine could be a problem, that kind of thing. So, right. anything else, Trustee? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Uh, Insurance Committee, Trustee McGrill. And no report, Mayor. How about the Ordinance and Legislation Committee, Trustee Pierce. No report, Mayor. You know what? Um, could we, at some point in time, have a discussion? Uh, we had brought out at the last meeting with regards to the B3. The attorney had talked about with B3 being business slash liquor and said that it made no sense because it was kind of circular in nature between what it was that we were doing and planning and zoning, setting that aside. So at some point in time, could we set up a time for discussion on that so that we can identify, is it in our best interest to simply have a B1 business and then control the liquor license through the liquor license issuance rather than the assumption of going to planning and zoning to get a B3 and then having come back and get a liquor license and make those amendments. Because, again, when we changed that, the liquor ordinance last time, it was my understanding that when a business vacated the business or, or lost their license, that that number was supposed to be reduced right. automatically. It seems to me that how, how do you ever know? Mm -hmm. And since by ordinance those liquor licenses are established, that means that we'd have to amend the ordinance every single time. Mm -hmm. Up yeah. and down, up and down. Right. Yeah. So just which we've done the last bunch of years is let's reduce it because somebody moved out and whatnot. And, yeah. and, I, and I get it. I understand the control of it. It just seems like what the attorney had said made more sense, and especially under that legalese of collateral estoppel well yeah because what, what we're doing here and every time we make a change and let's say you do have a business that comes in let's say like um rocky's place you know that they, they want to come in they're bringing in a, uh, an italian restaurant and they're asking for a beer and wine, wine license well now we have to schedule a plan and zoning commission hearing and we go through all this minutiae that we get that could have been cut to the chase by simply having a b3 across the board and just awarding it as such i think what i need to do even for that discussion for the planning for the ordinance and legislation committee is get an estimate from our attorney to say like from Vince Kanker he's their uh, zoning specialist to say what would it cost to do to basically rezone our, our commercial district and go from there and see if it's if it's of our value to us to spend that money to have that done because this way as a blanket that's what we we're talking about is the whole place is B3 and you're just awarding you know you're awarding a license as, as you see fit, period. Well, I agree with planning and zoning as far as the business aspect of it, and if it needs a change of classification, I just don't know about the B1 or the B3, remove B3, and just B1 take care of the liquor licenses through the liquor license. I mean, the board still controls the aspect of that. I mean, remove B1, you're saying. Right. No, B3, no, B3 is the business alcohol. Right. Right. But you can have alcohol under B1. the other ones, provided they have a special right. use. So. Right. right. So, I mean, it seemed to make sense because I didn't understand it before. And then when he had spoke to that, all of a sudden it was, I had my aha moment. Right. There's just so many other extra steps being made and um, sometimes not necessarily yet, too. I can understand where there's a special use involved of any type, but... Many times there's not. So um, let's we'll take a look at it. I'll see what the cost is. I mean, is. if you think it's worthwhile. I'm absolutely useless to it. I'm so confused. <laughs> I mean, do, do we get that on camera? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm going to Mike, too. Mike. <laughs> it's not All right, there. let's wrap up here. I mean, I've, I've got the Bible out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's not in yeah. there. Yeah. 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 I'm it's throwing the it out for, for later discussion. Yeah, so, um, I mean, could the next committee meeting, I mean, can we just yeah. come up with some talking points before? Great, before thank you. I gotta write this date down when you put this stuff, you know. Not at a loss for words. Yeah. Yeah. Not anything. We know better. Right, right. Can I borrow your car? <laughs> so, I get yours. <laughs> so we'll finish up here. Uh, next, Human Resource Committee, Trustee McGrill. No report, Mayor. I apologize, I skipped uh, IT. Trustee you, you have a habit of doing that. All the time. Yeah. Just getting to the finish line. I was looking at nine o'clock back there. 
<laughs> Just for that, I've got uh, <laughs> nothing to say. Thank All you. right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, Health and Pollution, Trustee Pierce. No report, Mayor. And then the Traffic Safety Committee, Trustee Dalzell. No report, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, any presentations, petitions, or communications? Anybody? No. Any unfinished business? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to uh, remind you we had a conversation uh, quite a while back uh, about appointments of the department heads. Mm -hmm. Certain, uh, I understand there was only one appointment made to one department head, and uh, just going over this, uh, I was, you know, by avoiding uh, your appointments, uh, you pretty much block the uh, legal ability to of the board to advise and consent, you know, by circumventing your power uh, around us. Uh, mm -hmm. And I understand that uh, Attorney Kankar at one point or another said um, something about the uh, your ability to uh, carry over or hold over certain appointments yeah. from a previous mayor and a previous administration. Right. Um, I, I, was, I was looking over some, uh, you know, the Illinois compiled statutes uh, over the past week or so, <laughs> and I didn't see anything that uh, related to that. So if you have any type of uh, written law or whatever that uh, can back that theory I'd appreciate something like that in writing mm -hmm. yeah um, we, we recently we we made an appointment of Mr. Early as, as a building commissioner and we had two other uh, we had water and um, public works that we adjusted police chief police chief police chief we appointed no I'm saying the ones that didn't was um, just recently was water and public works so, I mean, yeah, those were the two we were talking about that evening. We'll have to go through the list and, and double check. Actually, to the trustee's point, uh, it seemed that in days long past, every year the list of appointments was brought up and names were, were given and consent given and away things went. And actually, I'd be in favor of, of getting back to that, to sitting there and saying, here's the people, and I'm sure that all the people that are in those appointed positions would appreciate to, to see the support of the board uh, to say, hey, great job last year and looking forward to you this year as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, Roger I, I, Early I, was appointed, you said, right? Roger was, yeah. And then who else? Police chief. Police chief. The police chief? Yeah, I don't, I don't have the list in front of me right now, but the um, we have to, uh, we have to, I have to go back and revisit that because I don't think we didn't do anything with the fire chief. We didn't do anything with. Um, finance director, we didn't do anything with a few key people here in the village. So we'll serve it up. I didn't think uh, Public Works or uh, water, water Department was. No, they weren't also. either. That's what I just said. Okay. Yeah. So the majority of them have not been, and I, I don't feel it's uh, fair to the employees. Yeah, I can say in the six years that I was a trustee here, did we ever do that? No. But wouldn't that be a do an annual list of appointments? I mean, yeah, there's other communities. I know uh, years of John Chicago Rogers. Ridge is one of them. He's been uh, the mayor over there, has been the mayor for five years now, and he does them annually. Mm -hmm. um, he has a similar form of government as we do. But uh, to that end, um, you were saying that uh, in, in, the, in years past you haven't. Mayor Kitching's been mayor for 12 years, so... Yep. His appointments would still be his appointments, understandable. And actually, those appointments were done before Trustee Dalzell and I even took office. Those were actually done a week before we took office, so we never had any input in those either. So, um, yeah, we'll serve them up. It was, uh, it was poorly done, I think, at that time. Okay, well, let's because do it. Let's the, do it right. The trustees who yes. had one week 30th. left. Of being <laughs> trustees were asked to validate the picks the first for the year. ensuing at least one year. Oh, yeah, that doesn't sound. Yeah, and that had never been done before. But there's a first time for everything. Any new business? Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor?
Whoa, whoa, whoa. Trustee McLaurin, and who seconded it? I did. Thank you, Trustee Zelinsky. All in favor? Uh, Sheila Warren. That's a fine. Can I can have it. Have it. Uh, meeting <laughs> adjourned at 9.01? Yes. Yes, so.